Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 Thank you for joining us today. If you're online, joining us, welcome. We are uh, concluding a series, actually, on change your world, change the world. And, and w- but what I want to bring your attention to is in your program, if you'd pull that out, there is a little piece of paper just like this, and you will need this for the end of the service. I'm going to ask you just to put it away. We'll talk about it at the end, but you'll want to make sure and have it. So if you don't have one of these, Go ahead and put your hand up. Our ushers will get you one. It's, a, uh, it's something you'll want to participate in. Here, I've got a hand over here uh, up front. Uh, so a couple, a couple more up front over here. Do we have, hold on, I'm just making sure. Are we on this? Okay, good. Okay, so, well, um, so we're in this, they're up here. George, they're right over here. So um, we're in this series on Change Your World and and uh, a big part of changing our world begins with us, right? I mean, we've got to decide to do it. And, uh, and God wants us to play a part. He calls us into that role. And, and especially today, you know, when we look at the news and we see things like deteriorating around the world, even in our own country. And a lot of people think, hey, politics, uh, you know, politicians are the answer. And that is a part of it. But there's more than that. God has a bigger thing unfolding and we get to play an important part of that. We really do. And so uh, there's a p- portion in the New Testament where Jesus is talking about kind of the end times. He says that he's going to return and that actually some of the signs uh, of his return would be that things progressively like deteriorate. They get worse. In fact, he compares it to a day back with Noah. Notice he says, as it was in the days of Noah so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So in Matthew 24, Jesus spends the whole chapter talking about, hey, what it's going to look like at the end times, the last days. He says, we're in the last days. And he says, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. So that obviously is, well, what was it like in the days of Noah? And if you don't know the story of Noah, many of you do, because, you know, you just just hear it. It's one of the more popular stories of the Bible. It's when uh, things were getting real bad, uh, the wickedness in the earth was so bad that God was going to just start over and, and wipe everybody out. And he decides not to. Instead, he calls this guy Noah. He says, hey, I'm going to use him. And he, incur- he tells him to build an ark. And then God brings animals onto the ark two by two. You're, some of you are going, yeah, I've heard this. I thought that was like a fairy tale. You know, hey, listen, there is lots of scientific evidence for a global wide flood. I mean, with the way the fossils and the stratas are all put into it. I mean, you can look that up. I believe it. I think that when it comes to the miraculous, when it comes to God doing stuff, uh, I can't contain in my little brain what God can do. So I choose to believe it. It kind of reminds me of the story of the little girl. She was in class, and her assignment was to write a term paper. She wrote a little paper uh, for her teacher about how Jonah had survived by living in a whale. You know, that, if you know that story, he was, the Jonah the prophet was swallowed by this, this, this fish, this whale. And so she writes, it turns in the paper, the teacher is not a believer, and she gets angry, she gets mad. She goes, this is ridiculous. There is no way that a whale could swallow a human being. Their throat is not big enough. And not, even if they could, it would not, no one could ever live for three days in the belly of a whale. And so the little girl, she's not going to be pushed back. So she just goes, well, when I get to heaven, I guess I'll just, I'll just ask him. And she goes, well, what if Jonah isn't there? What if he didn't go to heaven? She goes, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> so, 
Now, there's a moral to that story, which is don't argue with little kids, right? <laughs> they have weapons that we don't have. It says the Lord, this is the story of, of, of Noah. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. So he's, he's going to do something about it. He's going, hey, this is, this is not good. And so the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So I want you to point, I want to point that out for the first thing is, is that uh, God wasn't worried, but he was in pain. He was grieved. He was saddened what was going on in the world at that day. And so it says, so the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. For I am grieved that I have made them. Now notice this. This is the second thing I want to point out to your attention. As he goes, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so God said, hey, there's all these bad stuff. Wickedness is going rampant throughout the world. And so his solution was a person. And today he has a solution for the increased problems of the world. You watch, maybe you've been guilty of saying, oh God, you got to do something. And he's going, that's you. You are the answer. I want you to be involved. And that's part of God's plan for how we make a difference. That's why I want to talk to you today about how to make a difference. It is upon us to make a difference. And that's a big part of what Vineyard Community Church stands for, is we're here to kind of join up and say, let's make a difference. Well, how does that happen? Well, we actually have a plan uh, a journey that we're going to invite you to be on if you're part of Vineyard. And that journey inv- begins with knowing God. Knowing God. Coming to a place where you really experience God. Not just kind of like you believe in God. Not that, you know, there's a force out there. But that you f- have this relationship where you actually can talk to God. And actually God speaks to you as well. And you have this connection with God. And you sense His presence in your life. That God... Is, is, is directing you and empowering you. This is all knowing God. And, and if, if you've never taken that step, that's the first step. If you're going to make a difference in your life, you got to take that step. Then the next is, is finding freedom. In other words, being free from your past. For some of you, you can, until, you, until you let go of some of the stuff in your past, your past has still got a grip on you. And it's, still, and it's still dominating you and foreshadowing and causing all of this draining emotions out of you and sucking the energy out and, 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 and sucking the hope out of your life. And finding freedom is a big part of that. You don't do that on your own. You do that with other people. You do that with other people. God's got a plan for you to do that. Then discover your purpose. You can't live out your purpose if you don't know it. And so we want to come alongside you through, like with Growth Track. That's what Growth Track's all about. Help you to discover your purpose, and then you make a difference. So all of those are important. We are highly committed to helping people know God and to find freedom to, and to, to know their purpose, to discover their purpose. But all of that is meant to lead to the final one. This is the one that is really the most important. How do I make a difference with my life? You're supposed to make a difference with your life. If you're breathing, the reason you're here, God's got a reason for it. He wants you to figure that out, find freedom, hit to know him, but in that process, you make a difference. And so all of us should be going in that direction. That's what King David did when he was alive. It says, for when David had served God's purpose in his generation, he fell asleep. He wanted to make a purpose. He wanted to make a difference with his life in his generation. And then I love how it says, then he, you know, he fell asleep. It doesn't say he died. Because, you know, the Bible says that to be, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's, we, we go, we're with God. And so he says, Jesus says, actually, we kind of like skip death. In other words, our body falls asleep, our body dies, but our spirit, the who you really are, goes on and lives for all eternity. And so, but in the meantime, before your body goes to sleep, you got something to do. You got a mission, you've got a project And it's making a difference with your life. And so we all kind of come together and we realize that's what God wants us to do. God needs you. He wants to use you. And so that's great news. In fact, if you look at what Jesus said, the only time he comments about 
correcting all of the ails of this world is, is when he says this. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He wants you to come along and help be part of the workforce, his team, to make a difference in the world. Okay? And so we can make a difference in three different ways. Number one is just through the people, the people around us, the closest to us. This is your calling. Your primary calling is not to the world. Your primary calling is not even to our country. Your primary calling is to those people who are closest to you, the people you influence. There's some of the hardest ones to influence because they, if they reject us, it hurts the most. It's way easier to share your faith with somebody you don't know. Because if they go, ah, I don't want any of that, you go, ah, I didn't care for you anyways. You know, I mean, just kind of like, you might not say that, but you don't really care what they say, what they think. You care and th- what people think that are in your life. That's why you have the greatest impact in their life. It says, the, notice this, it says, that the Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family. So his decision to make a difference with his life inf- impacted his whole family. It wasn't just him. His, his whole family got impacted because he was obedient. He said, I'm going to make a difference with my life. Here's a New Testament verse. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Now notice this, you and your whole household. Now, when I heard, read this verse years and years ago, originally I thought, well, what does this mean? If I come to Christ, if I give my life to Christ, that means everybody, all my family automatically goes to heaven? No, that's not what it says. What it means is that you will have the ability to impact those people for that purpose, to impact them. This word here, household, actually is the Greek word oikos, which means sphere of influence. It means your, your family, your relatives. It also means the sphere of influence that you have, people that your classmates, your workmates, your neighbors, people that are in your life, your sphere of influence, you can impact them. And we all get a chance to do that. You get a chance to impact the people that are close to you. You're gonna, and, and so that's part of what, uh, what we do together. The second thing is, is for my generation. I get to influence the people in my generation, which is not just like people in my age bracket. It's the people that are alive today. You get to influence all the people that are alive while you're alive. That's your generation. And we need that. You know, sometimes it's so easy to just feel so uh, helpless. Like, hey, I can't really do anything. Look at this thing's out of control. You watch the news and it's just, the whole thing's like out of control. But you can change things. You can change your world. That's why we've been talking about this. You can make a difference. Sometimes in our political system, people get so frustrated. They don't like their choices. You know, who am I going to, I don't care for anybody, but I hate that person. So I'm voting against that. I mean, just, they're real frustrated. You know, you can do something about that. With some of you, you need to run for office. I'll vote for you. You know, and just, hey, listen, this is what we need to, this, is, this isn't what I believe. You know, I look at some of the stuff in these parties and I think, well, I like some of that stuff. I like some of that stuff. I don't like some of that stuff. I don't like, but we get to, we can change stuff. Sometimes you just change things at the local level. Get involved, you know, in your, in your city uh, government or, you know, your civic league. You just, there's, you can't do everything, but you, you say, you know what, I'm going to do something to make a difference in my community. I'm not going to just sit idly by. Some people are thermometers. All they do is tell you what the temperature is. Other people are thermostats. They set the temperature. And God wants you to be a thermostat. He wants you to make a difference. Hey, this is what it's going to do. This is what it's going to be like. You are to influence them. The prophet Jeremiah says, do not let them influence you. You get to be the influencer. You, you, you decide what things are going to be like. Then you also get to be a difference maker for God. People near us, in our generation, and for God. God wants you to be an influencer for Him. You get to stand up for God. You know, a lot of people, they're afraid to stand up for God. Probably more so today than ever. So glad Noah wasn't afraid. God asked him to do something pretty crazy. Hey, why don't you build a boat? Okay. I mean a ship. Oh, wow. A whole ship. Yeah. And at that time, people didn't understand 
you know, there had never been a flood before. I mean, there, people are mocking at, laughing at him. Ha, 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 stupid guy, look at him. They're just doing life as normal. They're mocking. I'm glad he didn't collapse to the ridicule of his generation. He was doing something for God. Some of us were afraid to pray at a public restaurant over our meal. Who's going to pray? Not me. Somebody might be in here and see me. You know? It's so easy to fall into that. And the world, they are loud and proud about their lifestyle and their choices and what they're doing. And here we're embarrassed about our God. And so you shouldn't do that. We, we, we need to stand up for what we believe. I'm going to be a difference maker for God. Look, at, I love this to the prophet Ezekiel. God says, I looked for a man. Now, this is more the, the, the word there actually means like mankind, something bigger. He goes, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall. For those of you who are Donald Trump supporters, I guess that's your verse, right? <laughs> uh, that's kind of like dangerous turf, isn't it? Okay. And stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. He said, hey, I'm looking for somebody. And uh, just so that you know, I was just kidding about that. I want to point <laughs> for anyone. This is the same verse, just different translation. For anyone who would build again the wall of righteousness. We're not talking about border walls. We're talking about <laughs> character walls. We're talking about influencing your culture and, and, and being the change. And we can do that. We can do that, certainly. You get a chance to do that. And we get to do it together. Now, Serve Day, I love that Serve Day, how we got to come together and influence our culture yesterday in a practical way. All of, we had 100, over 160 people in eight different teams doing all kinds of stuff. One of the teams I served on, we were mowing lawns, people just blowing through, knocking on the door. Hey, can we mow your lawn? We'd, and we just cranking through them. And somebody didn't have a red shirt. And, uh, you know, and so, I, so what was up with that? Somebody came up and said, hey, we have somebody here serving without a red shirt. I said, well, should we get him one? He goes, oh, well, he actually is just one of the neighbors. We wanted to mow his lawn. We found out, he found out what we were doing. He goes, can I join you? So he's just kind of mowing lawns with us. He goes, hey, I want to be part of this. And we just get to serve in so many different ways. It's so awesome to be able to go and, 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 and touch people. And, and, and one of our serves was going to uh, the, um, e, the EMS helping the first responders. And they had said that, that one of the things they need was li little like stuffed animals for kids. In a crisis, you can give them a, a toy or some, a stuffed animal and it calms them down. And so we were able to raise 100 stuffed animals along with other things that we did, gift baskets. We went and served them, gave them all these stuff. Just one after another, we're going in, serving all, you know, our, our medical community, all kinds of things we did. I thought it was, just, it, was just, it was just incredible. Here's a brief video that I just kind of summarizes a little bit. If you were in some of these, you'll see, you might see yourself. Uh, if you weren't able to make it, you'll get, a, get to see a little bit what we did yesterday. Watch this. Was awesome wasn't it i love it big shout out to everybody who gave up a big chunk of their day yesterday 
And it just doesn't end with that. We believe serving is a way in order to touch our community, to make a difference. And so we serve all the time. One of the things we do is we have something called the dream team, where we come and we serve and people are serving all over, doing stuff in our church, not just during the week, like in the food pantry, and all, but also during, during the weekend. So that people that come and they experience Christ in our services, it happened because of all of the teams that are going on behind the scenes and in front of people. I mean, we have people that are, that are praying and, and giving out coffee. We have people standing out in the hot sun, you know, being there for new people that come in. We have people at the information. We have people that are, are you know, ushering and greeting and working the cameras and, and putting the words on the, the screen. And, and we invite you to be part of that. We're doing fine without you, but we would do better with you. We want you to be part of what we're doing. It's, we're having a great time. And, that's, and really, if, you want, if you're missing joy in your life, you're wondering, how do I really get joy? It comes through serving. It comes through doing something that's not about you. It's kind of counter, and we think, how do I get joy? Maybe if I just spend a lot of money on myself and I go to Disneyland. And, and No, that's... You can, you can create little bubbles of happiness by buying stuff and all and getting a jolt of, of some endorphins and, and here and there, but some dopamine shots in your brain. Oh, I feel good. A little bit. No, real joy comes from, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about somebody else. I'm, I'm going to care for other people. And you can make a difference. And so we invite you to do that, to come and make a difference. To, step one in our growth track is where it's about you and your, you and the, you and your church. Step two is about you and your gifts. Step three is about you and your influence. And step four is about you making a difference. And we get to do that. And we get to do it together. Jesus invites us, hey, you know, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. And so he says, that's the answer to the ails of this world. So why wouldn't anybody take up Jesus on that great call? You know, he says, Come on, make a difference with your life. Well, I think primarily it's fear. And four fears I want to look at real quick. Well, number one is, is we're afraid of the past. We're afraid of the past. In other words, somebody, hey, why don't you come and serve on the dream team, be part of what we're doing? And they either say or they think, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how many times I've been married or the habits that I still have. You don't know what I did last night. And they let fear Get the best of them because of their past. Now, Jesus, when he was rallying his groups together, his disciples, he didn't go to the religious and the perfect. He got the commoner. He just got a couple sailors. He goes, that'll do. Add a little spice to our community. <laughs> and then I'll get a couple financiers that don't see eye to eye. They operate, you know, one likes to steal, one likes to save, you know. And, and he just kind of grabbed this group together. And he said, Let's work out, let's, let's make the kingdom of God be manifest in this group and to the world through this group. Often we think that the things we've done are the things that disqualify us. But let me tell you this, that the things you think disqualify you actually qualify you. Because nobody wants to hear from, snoo some, from some snooty, uppity, religious, goody two-shoes. You know, nobody wants to hear from them. They want to hear from you. You've gone through it. You're on the other side. You're working on it with Christ, but you're, you're, you're on a different pathway, but you've experienced it. You've been there. It qualifies you. You don't be afraid of your past. Look, at it. it says God's gifts. That's what God's doing in your life. And God's call, which he has on your life, are under full warranty, never canceled, never rescinded. No matter what you do, in the past, have done or will do. It doesn't change God's call on your life. He'll still use you. You can still make a difference. You might have to ask for forgiveness and say, God, I'm sorry. I need your help. I'm going to walk away with this with your power. But it's never, ever canceled or rescinded. He says, I want to use you. You don't have to be afraid of what you've done. You don't have to be afraid of your past. Secondly, is afraid of the crowd. What other people will think of you? What other people will say about you? You know, what do people say if they see me worshiping here? You know, some of you, you want, you look around, you go, man, that person's really expressing themselves. 
They're really connecting to God. I, I would, and there's a little nudge in you that kind of wants to do that. I'd like to express myself a little bit more. You're thinking, nope, no, don't. You know, your little hand wants to go up. No, stay down. Somebody might see me. Don't let that happen. Nobody's looking at you. We're looking at God. We give you permission. Just express your faith to the Lord. Express your love to the Lord. You know, I mean, we're not going to call your mom. Hey, I saw your, your, your kid doing this. No. Just be, express your love. You know, in, in the days of the Holocaust, that some of the churches in Germany, they knew what was happening when they were putting all those Jews on the trains and shipping them off to be killed in the concentration camps. And when they would hear the trains filling up or going by, the story goes is that they would just sing louder when they were meeting in church. They would just sing louder. We don't want to be like that. You know, we, don't, we're, we can't be afraid of the crowd, what they're going to think about us, whether we're praying at a restaurant or whether, what we're doing in, in our services. It says, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. That's where our, our focus should be. Is God, I wanna, I wanna, I'm afraid of missing my calling. I'm afraid of missing not making a difference for you with this one and only life. Fear of taking the first step. Sometimes that can be a fearful thing. How do I take the very first step? I've never done this before. It feels awkward. I'm not used to it. I don't, I'm, I'm a real... Uh, Orderly person, I like everything thought through. Well, sometimes it just doesn't happen like that. And you take a first step. I mean, have you, have you ever gone into, like you're at a pool or at the ocean, and you go and you go, woo, it's a little cold. And you have two options, right? Because you're going swimming. But you have two options. One is, is you go in slow, which is the miserable way, right? <laughs> a little bit. Whoa, it's so cold, I'm trying to, and then you do another, oh, finally it's like, okay, and then you get a little higher, a little higher. The other way is just to jump in, right? You dive in, it's, it's over, like, it's like, hey, water's good. Everybody on the, come on in. Don't do it that way. The first step, when you step in and say, I'm going to do something. I'm going to get involved in a small group. I'm going to take growth track. I'm going to take that next step. I'm going to go in. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. I'm glad he picked up a hammer. And he started working. He thought, hey, I'm going to business. I mean, this is going to take a while. He could have just sat there and perseverated and perseverated and procrastinated. No, he gets to work. He does it taking the first step. You know, God has been nudging some of you to take another step. And truth be known, you've been resisting. So I want to read a verse, and then I want to nudge you a little bit, okay? The Lord said, this is God speaking through Elijah. Elijah wanted to have an encounter. He wanted to hear from God. He needed to hear from God. And so he goes to have this encounter with God, and here's what happens. It says, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to speak to you. He's about to pass by. And then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. He's th now, God should be in that, right? Some, something big is happening. You know, wind, powerful wind, tearing things apart. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. And the Lord was not in the earthquake. You'd think he'd be in the earthquake. That certainly would be a sign, right? God's speaking to me through an earthquake. After the earthquake, there came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. So he has everything. His earth, wind, fire. That would make a good band, wouldn't it? <laughs> He's got it all, you know, coming at him. God's not speaking to him through that. Notice it says, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. Another translation says a still, small voice. That's his nudging. Part of hearing from God is recognizing how he nudges you. The still, small voice. And then you stop resisting. You say, God, I'm going to step out. I'm going to trust you. I think God is nudging some of you this. 
don't do it. Don't cop out. Don't throw on the towel. Don't fall for that temptation. I think this is one. And then the opposite for some of you. I think the Holy Spirit's saying do it. You need to move forward. You've been where you're at long enough. You need to, you need to do it. You need to take that next step. I think the Holy Spirit is saying to some of you, hang in there because you're tired. You're emotionally exhausted. You're depleted spiritually. I mean, you don't have the hope and the vision. It's just there's something. And he's saying, hang in there. Hang in there. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to, I'm going to see you through this. I think the Holy Spirit's saying to some of you, take the risk. There is a risk. We're going to be starting a series next week called Holy Spirit Living Third Person. And there's going to be risk-taking that's involved whenever you encounter the Holy Spirit, whenever you go to God. There's always risk, but it's worth the risk. Take the risk. Take the risk. I think God's saying to some of you, apologize now. You go, Andy, it's not even my fault, the rift that's going on. But you have the ability to make it right. And God's saying, I want you to make it right. You do what you need to do. Reach across the aisle. Do what you need to do to to repair that relationship. I think the Holy Spirit would say to some of you, it's time for you to get help. It's not recreational anymore. It's, It's an addiction. And God wants you to get help. And you have to recognize, I can't do it on my own. I'm not going to win this struggle in my own little silo. I need help. I think the Holy Spirit's saying to some of you, slow down. You're, just, you're not going to be able to complete the race at the speed you're going. You've got to slow down. When we're caring for our soul, those are the things that happen in the slower lane, not in the fast lane. You can do business. You can do a lot of things in the fast lane. Caring for your soul happens in the slow lane. You go, well, how do I know if I'm going slow enough? Well, if you don't have time to read God's word each day and to spend a little time in prayer, you're going too fast. That's, that's, that's the measure of that. Because what happens if you don't feed your soul, your soul gets weak. And if you let that go on long enough, your soul gets sick. And then when you have a sick soul, you make sick decisions. Some God's, I think, saying to some of you, slow down. Others of you, I think he's saying, there's more. You've been coming to church. You've been dancing around this thing called Christianity. You've been looking at it, peering in. God's saying, I have more that you'll never get by just looking from the outside. You've got to take that step. You've got to move forward. God says, I have more for you. And I think Holy Spirit's saying to some of you, it's time. This is your moment. Not tomorrow, not next week. You've made enough rationalizations, enough excuses. You've put this off. It's time. This is the time. This is the moment. I think he's also saying you can do it. You can do it. Not on your own, but you can do it. And God says, I want to help you do it. I want to help you. You can do it. You no, know, I can't. You can. You, that's the Holy Spirit nudging you. You can do it. I want to close with this last fear that I think that can sideline us. This is the fear of failure. What if, what if, it, what if I fail? Well, I mean, that, that's as old as time, right? A fear of failure. But God says, he's, he goes, I have set a promise for you. Think of what he did for Noah. I love this with Noah. He goes, I have placed a rainbow in the clouds as a sign of my promise. In other words, when things get difficult, when things get rough, remember what I did for you, how I saw you through. And he says, there's a, a rainbow. You look at that and you remember, okay, God loves me. God cares about me. I, I know he's not going to let me down. He'll be there for me. Jesus said it this way. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's his rainbow to you. When you're in a difficult time, you remember God's rainbow, which is Jesus loves me. He cared for me. He died on the cross for me. He bought my soul. I can trust my salvation and my eternity to his care. And the good news about that is, is if you can entrust your entire eternity into God's care through Jesus, that means you can, you can trust those other things. You can trust your kids to him. 
You can trust your finances to him. You can trust your, your, your future health to Jesus. There's no reason to be afraid and to have worry in your life. You can be filled with hope. You can be filled with a future of hope and joy because God says, trust, trust me, trust me. Now, what I want you to do is take this little slip out. I mentioned it to you at the beginning of the service in your program. Take, I want everybody to participate. Take this, this, this piece of paper out. This is a life ruler. This is your life. Okay, how long you're going to, each, each of these marks represents in decades how long you're going to live. Okay? And so what I want you to do, this is probably most of us, I don't think any of us will live to the very end of this piece of paper. So just your best guess, I, we don't know, right? But your best guess, I want you to cr make a crease on the year that you think you'll die. Okay? The year that you think you'll die. So I, listen, I, I'm, I live large, so I think I'm going to live into my 90s. I'm going to put 93 for me, okay? So you're thinking, Andy, you, uh, you got a lot of faith, buddy. Well, you know, nobody knows, right? So I'm just putting it, 93. It doesn't, just you do whatever you think. Put a crease right there on the year you think you'll die. And then what I want you to do is bend it back and forth. Kind of put a nice good crease in it because you're going to rip it, Okay? Nice. Now when it's, it's kind of loose, if you need to lick it, you can do that. You have my permission. Then you, you can just rip it right off, okay? This is your future, okay? And, but this is your future in heaven. So you're going to put this away. This is going to heaven, okay? This is the part of you that's, you're in heaven now. So you can just put that away. You won't need that. That's entrusted to God. Everybody did that? Okay, next, I want you to do one more crease. And that's your age today. Now, there's no guesswork on that, right? You, you, know, you know that one. Mine's 56. So you just put a nice crease right there at your current age. Back and forth, bend it. Back and forth, and then tear that off. Okay. This is your past. And that includes your regrets, things you'd wish you had done differently, things maybe you're even ashamed of. And this is your past. And so that can, your past can only hold you back if you let it. And so we're going to just cover this, say, God, forgive us. This is in the past. I can't change my past. And so just crumple this up, okay? This is going in the trash. We're not letting anything hold us back. Okay? So we, one piece is already in heaven, so that's gone. The other one's now going in the trash, and you're left with this small little piece of paper. Some of us, it's smaller than others. Okay? <laughs> and here's mine. Little piece of paper that represents our life. This is what you have left. This is the only part. When we talk about make a difference, it's only going to happen in here if it's going to happen. Now, for me, when I came across this a, a few, weeks, few weeks back, it really impacted me. So I just put it, I have it on my desk, right there next to my phone and my computer. I look at it. And every time I look at it, I think, you don't have much time left. Keep going. You know, just make, make it count. Make it count for eternity. Make decisions that will last for eternity. And we all get to make that choice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to hold it, okay? Because it is precious. It represents something special. Certainly, if it means something and you want to do that, put it on your desk, put it somewhere where you'll see it, you, please do that. But for right now, I want everybody, would you just hold it? And I'm going to pray over our lives, over, the, over what this represents right now, okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that we get to make a difference for you. Help us, Lord, to do that, to make a difference in our sphere of influence, with the people that are around us day in and day out. Help us, Lord, to make a difference in our generation. While we're alive, young and old, this is the generation we can make a difference in. And we're not just thermometers up on the wall 
whining about how hot it's getting. But we get to make a difference. And Lord, help us to make a difference for you. That this one and only life, that we wouldn't waste it, we wouldn't squander it. We would invest it in the lives of others for eternity's sake, for Christ's sake. And so, Lord, I pray against any kind of fear that would try to hold us back on our, on our past, something that kind of disqualifies us. God says that actually qualifies you. He wants to use that if you let him. Afraid of what other people think or say. You say, God, give me the boldness to stand up. The world's standing up. They're loud and proud about what they're doing. Help me not to, not to be ashamed of you. Would you say, God, help me to take the first step. And for some of you, as we were talking about the nudging of the Holy Spirit, that is your next step. Don't resist anymore. Would you say, God, I want to just put my hands in a posture of just receiving and not resisting. Help me to take that next step. The nudging of the Holy Spirit. Would you do that? Say, God, help me not to fear failure, to know that you'll be there with me to the very end. Now I want to just pray for those of you who you are not close to God right now. You know you're far from him. And that is your next step. And so for those of you, I just want to pray for you. If you would, just allow me to pray, to pray with you. You pray along with me and say, God, I'm ready to, I'm ready to come home. I, I want to hear you. I want to have forgiveness. I want to have meaning in my life and joy and all those other things. If that's you, then I just want you to pray with me right where you're at. Would you say, dear God, right there in your heart, you can whisper it, pray it. Just, dear God, forgive me for my sin. And then just pray, say, I look to Jesus. I look to Jesus today, and I want to follow him. Say, God, help me to discover my purpose, to find freedom, and to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.